I have gone through the book, which is more than what I can say in the case of other releases, for the simple reason that after a long time I find something that is readable and endable. Our problem is we start on a book and then something distracts us and then we keep a fly leaf and it's that's the end of the story. Uh, I like it for another different reason that it just fits into what I call flight reading. Most of us who get to read only during flights because at the end of the day when you've finished everything, completed everything, the wife says it's my time. So there goes your reading. So flight reading is something that's very convenient and anything beyond a number of pages tends to read, remain unread. Uh, everybody has commented on the dialogic style and the first uh, school on, of the dialogic way of narration was of course attributed to Athens and uh, Socrates. Socrates, but uh, very few are aware, I'd have to go home and check, check out the dates, that we had in India the first organized religion, the first non-state organization, I'm saying this in front of Vedna Desai, the first non-state organization emanated, that is known, recorded, emanated from here, and its variants would be appearing in every non-state organization like the bureaucracy, like the church, like the Islamic State, it's appearing. And what is this? You have a voluntary organization. People volunteer to come. People would like to come, so there's a screening process. With the entry screening process determination, you are taken in as an novitiate, a novice, for a particular amount of time, an IAS probationer, an IPS probationer. After you qualify, you are taken into the regular uh, scheme of things. You get graded promotions, you are transferable anywhere. I am referring to the Buddhist church. The first non-state organization, and this nobody talks about it. Every other organization in the world, from the, as I mentioned, from the Catholic state, from the Roman church, to the bureaucracy, to the Marxist uh, party, or this more or less the same structure. Whether they took it from it, or did it on their own, or came to the same conclusion, I would not be able to say. That's what we do and others to find out. Now, one of the reasons for the stunning popularity of Buddhism was not only that very oversimplified appeal against the caste system, frankly the caste system hadn't solidified till then. Economics, the economic means of production didn't allow the caste system to solidify by the 7th century, 6th century BC. It's a lot of a retrospective analysis. Yes, there were systems that were conflicting, a certain amount of egalitarian, inegalitarianism that was creeping in, and a certain requirement for um, for uh, upward mobility, for uh, freedom within occupational choice that led to, let us say, uh, more enterprising groups coming up. You know that the most enterprising group that came and joined Buddhism was known as Reshta. Until today, that got uh, stamped with the uh, business community, the entrepreneur. We do not differentiate between the entrepreneur and the maker of wealth. Till today, we call them Setha, Sreshta, Sethi, Settar in South, in Chetia in Tamil Nadu. The word for entrepreneur continues even on our. So anyway, coming back to the Buddhist church, the first most interesting way was their narration of how they got across the usually obfuscating philosophy. And the best book in this regard that is referred are not the suttas. Please avoid them. Like the Upanishads, I read them but once and stay miles away. Uh, the suttas, the tripitaka, and the, these are various ways, they are only for name dropping. I have to go plow through almost everything, that's what I am saying. They give you a headache. The best narrative on Buddhism and the most communicative one was the questions of Radha, Raja Melinda. Raja Melinda's questions. And that explains in his conversational style, what is the problem? What is what I say? This is another part of the dialogic narrative that needs to be covered in greater detail because India needs to claim her position, not because some people think that for, for different reasons, but because it makes sense that we need to claim that space back. And there are these 
non-colonial, post-colonial focus areas were simply dropping out. Now, this dialogue reform Amit has followed, and more important, there is a generational divide where the where the uh, the heart of India is concerned. There is a consignment of all, uh, let us say, if I may use the word Hindu text or sacred text, to something that you do after 50 or 60. And, well, everybody knows more or less what happened, especially after all the television and film narratives, film stories. But even so, it's kind of old-fashioned. You have to get this because we live and breathe one of the narratives. And that's the difference between the two. Don't lump them together. Amit is absolutely right when he says that, or he hints at, that Mahabharata preceded the Ramayana. Everybody, every historian knows that. Because the Mahabharata contains a lot of elements that are usually prescribed as primitive. Now, primitive is a word that analysts, anthropologists, and others avoid because it's a pejorative word. It contains the seeds of our society as they existed in an undiluted form, as was where it was. No cover up. Now, uh, the question is how do you relate this to the uh, to the generation that is going to inherit the world when you leave. Are they going to get interested or are they going to consign it to one corner saying it is a patrimony which we keep under wraps and sort of look like the Torah, we look at a distance and do a little bit of worship but anyway, move on man, it doesn't really matter in our lives. The question of bringing this relevance into our daily lives is brought out by two young chaps as he said, Jayanto said, on our, and Amit did it purposely on a lot of rum. So this could be another Ramayana. <laughs> so it's cool. Uh, but, it is a, but he focuses through this, uh, through the, let us say, through the spirits that waft after, through the wisdom that is induced by the Holy Spirit. And he comes across the liberty and then questions. But there are uncanny insights, and that's where uncanny insights where he grasps it, where he grasps it and gets it all. But uh, as I said, when the young are concerned and they're not concerned about footnote and sub footnote and reference to the main text, it will suffice. It will suffice. So uh, to that extent, without the understanding of what we have, there's no big deal in having a great tradition if it goes off with passing generations or is consigned as a Brahmanical text, a Hindu text. Uh, my religion is very personal, like most sensible people. But and uh, I would not like to uh, make much public ado about what I believe in. He has gone on and used first class, first state model language from uh, from the from the idiom of uh, almost the millennial generation. Though he just before them, I guess mutants, clones, and others. <coughs> I heard the word. Ninja, Turtle and the Mutants for my son, who is about 33 now. So this one he has put in, therefore bringing the relevance at every point. He has questioned or tried to explain monogamy, polygamy, a very uncomfortable question of how Kunti could have five different sources, etc, etc. And of course, there are people who jump to the conclusion that if you had five, therefore you must be modern, and therefore you must be liberated, and therefore you must be. That again is the ascription of value judgment that screws up uh, clarity of thought. Whether you are monogamist or polygamist by choice or by nature or by genetic pull, it's a different matter. We we, we can take we can take uh, calls on that. But that the narrative, and I come to the narrative now. The narrative of Mahabharata is, in my humble opinion, the grand supranarrative of the Indian people. It has to be under first as the narrative of the Indian people. It is a Magna Carta of India. It is not a Magna Carta that was signed under pressure by King John. It is a living Magna Carta that was fused and debated upon for about, <laughs> again, my studies, historians place it exactly within 400 to 500 years. 
between the 2nd century BC and the 4th century AD. I mean, they are very clear about dates. I had to suffer linear history. I believe in reality of history. But to understand India, you have to delinearize yourself. So, the strict European linearity of history where it's all marked on a table with benchmark is one way of understanding it. But here we belong to a civilization that thinks in terms of circles, continuous circles, like a concert in a wire. So if you stretch out a concert in a wire, you get bumps. You can't get. So our narrative spiral. Uh, is spiral. This is the narrative. It is spiral not because we are confused or not because we go around in circles, which is also a fact, we do. But because it was required. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, another cultural federalism, I'm repeating, another cultural federalism in the world, another subcontinent in the world, where you have distinctly counted about 24, 26 different ethnic groups, languages, mega languages, with 600 dialects. Hundreds of castes, hundreds of colors, every shape and color under the sun, coming together and believing in the same destiny, in the same history, unless you force it on them. Everybody shares the same history and everything, unless it's sort of forced upon them. And without the aid of a central Vatican, a metta, a church, or any discipline authority. How did it come about? Now this is the 24th year of my life and tossing with that question when I went very serious. And the, one of the answers lies in what we call the layering of narratives. In Mahabharata we find the first wisps of it captured not in any story but in explanations of Patanjali and Panini. First wisps of the stories are coming up. Krishna being mentioned, you being mentioned and not in their deified form as superheroes, etc. Amit, I don't know how much he's gone into it, but his second uncanny thing about the interpolation and the interjection, extrapolation of the Gita, a five-hour discourse when you're about to go in for battle, this has struck everyone. But the positioning of the discourse was done rather deliberately and happened over a period of many years where the centrality of the argument had to be maintained in spite of the plurality of stories. So the centrality of it had to be put in, posited somewhere and nothing could be more exciting than the position of the most excited thing when they come to that confrontation after so much provocation. So the defining moment was there and it's definitely an interlocution. Everybody knows it. Uh, he is not supposed to know. He's not, uh, he is not. He has spent his life uh, managing things and making money, uh, hopefully. And uh, so this is one those who have toiled in audit. Now coming back to the coming back to the Magna Carta. That is this. These stories of the Mahabharata, as I said, appear first in the late late Upanishadic age. That's around 500, 600 BC. So it refutes the basic fact that the Mahabharata was a Brahmanical response to the Buddhist um, challenge. Well, chronologically, yes, the Mahabharata emerged in a mature form when Buddhism had sort of reached its peak. So therefore, linear historians would look upon it as a challenge, the response. As I said, in terms of time, yes. But the, the beginnings, the sutras of the Mahabharata begin even before Buddha is born. That means these were floating tales that were captured, interwoven, kept in for entertainment. The Mahabharata starts with as a tale of the Sutars, Ram Sutar or Chutars, the carpenters, charioters and others. It's a balladic tale, it's a ballad. And this ballad is an oral narrative, like the like the Rigveda and everything. These are all oral narratives that were captured captured, refined into later syntax, drama, rhyme, meter. There's an oral narratives and the first time we hear about it is around the 2nd century BC, maybe 3rd, when we come across it as a group of poems known as Jaya, Jaya. 
and from the jaya the story then becomes becomes snowballing taking in other sub stories windows sub windows this that other side stories that are equally interesting and rolls itself up from the jaya to the bharata or bharata bharata it's a very twist of a this thing whether you put an a or an a like most people don't know that it's not bharata natyam it's bharata natyam it's bharata natyam so we are in our the sanskrit a and a you got to be five the five of them so it's not ashoka it's ashoka it's one day that never comes in english so mahabharata jaya bharata bharata mahabharata it takes its journey over a period the most mature period is between the second century bc or the third century bc and ends around the third century blossoms in the early gupta period fourth century now forget history the can you tell another narrative of another religion assuming that it is linked to the religion it's linked to the people it's linked to the people of hindustan to the people of the subcontinent it's not it's not essentially a what i would call a one religious narrative the parts of its performance are contributed in economic terms in participatory terms by people of many religions even if you look at even mahabharat you find that the ravan uh, festival is contributed by many castes and communities and many religions the essential point is that the mahabharat remains a, a living tradition or similes or metaphors of vivishan shikhandi this that we use words so freely that we never check back like shakespeare oh god this came from here this came from here. we believe read it and live it the bible is the nearest that we have but the inheritors of the bible do not use it the way we do so it's not one frozen narrative or story that we sort of add on but we have imbibed it it is interjected with our blood and even the entire linguistic formulations are all built around metaphors and similes that come from there so mahabharat as the grand narrative of india requires to be studied as the grand narrative with an open mind the openness of mind is a different thing as amit has said and others have said the openness would entail a certain degree of risk taking risk taking because in our business unless you footnote it and prove it you will be flicked off like a fly so that is there and you have a whole bunch of sanskritists sitting over it as if they own the damn thing all lot of brahmanical what obscurantists sitting over it and think they own what is called the common narrative of india just because their forefathers played around with it okay we have to de we have to unshackle it and bring it for discourse as society lives on discourse not on lectures a society lives through dialogue discourse discord and mahabharat is the best example of how it lives through it it has to be a living process where a platform is offered for arguments and then taken to what we call a draft proposition the plurality of india the life of india the divergences of india that are held together are held together by apart from a grand narrative a grand tradition of debate and discourse and i'm so glad that he has been able to highlight it highlight it so it is in this light apart from the interpretation that he brings about where it makes meaning to the young generation and also tung had said in our times when everything was mau in calcutta presidency college the world belongs to you you the dressing the youth the world belongs to us ultimately it belongs to you so to those who are the ultimate inheritors of the world unless they own up all our exaggerations all our raptures about our own inheritance will not mind thank you amit for bringing it one step closer thank you okay.